All right, so I just want to preface this by saying I'm not actually the biggest Star Wars fan. I've seen all the movies, I've seen most of the shows, and I just think it's pretty good. I own some Lego sets, I even own, you know, some Darth Vader comics, and I'm not really a super fan or anything like that. So when I heard people on Reddit and TikTok saying that the prequels were actually pretty good and that everyone was just overreacting back then when they first came out, I got a little curious. I haven't seen those movies since I was a little lad, and I liked them at the time given the fact my brain was the size of a peanut that a monkey would have gone crazy over, so I rewatched the prequels, and um, I'm not sure if you guys are seeing the same movie as me. These movies are actually not good. I don't know what you guys are going on about, but Jesus, they are so boring and weird. But that's not what I'm here to talk about. What I am here to talk about is what I did after I rewatched the prequels. My train of thought was chugging along, and I was thinking about how the fan base swapped their opinions on the prequels over the years, and I thought maybe the sequels aren't as bad as we remember either, and maybe we're just waiting for the fan base to swap their opinions on them too. So that's where it began. This stupid little question in my brain. Are the sequels actually that terrible? So now I'm going to talk about my findings along this adventure. Talking about The Force Awakens, The Last Jedi, and and The, the Rise of Skywalker, too, I guess. Now, I'm going to try my best to avoid any nitpicking. I consider that to be any small details that don't really matter, such as where did Kylo Ren get Darth Vader's mask? Did he just go back to the bonfire after it burned in the sixth movie? I don't really care where he got his mask. It doesn't really matter to the story. It's just a small thing that you can point out. What I do care about are character motivations, the consistency of the world, soundness of the plot. I also kind of care about other stuff like cinematography and sound design and things like that, but I'm a writer, not a composer, so my opinion on those things don't really carry as much weight. I'm also not going to mention that Rey is a woman. If you're here for some sexist garbage bashing Rey for being a Mary Sue, look at one of the other millions of Star Wars video essays out there. Generally, I think Rey's character stays consistent in regards to her motivations and power level, with a few exceptions I'll get into later. And Rey being a woman has no bearing on the story whatsoever, so from here on, I'm not going to mention it, okay? We're good. Now that all that's out of the way, let's talk about Star Wars Episode Seven, The Force Awakens. And first things first, does anyone else remember that whole marketing campaign that was like, which side are you on, light side or dark side? I, I remember it so much leading up to this movie, and I can't find it, like, anywhere. What, what the hell's going on with that? I, I saw all those ads when I was a kid, and I thought that we were in store for some gritty war drama about how there are bad people on both sides of the war and stuff like that, and what we got was nothing like that. So I was a little disappointed at the time. Instead of that, this movie opens with a classic title crawl and an admittedly awesome rendition of the original Star Wars theme. Let's see what our old buddies have gotten up to since they risked their lives and the lives of everyone in the galaxy to destroy the Empire. I'm especially curious as to what Luke is up to after his dad died sacrificing himself to destroy Palpatine. Let's give this a read, shall we? <sighs> Right, what do we have here? Luke Skywalker has vanished. And from the ashes of the evil empire, the First Order has risen. Yeah, we, we can just go with that, I guess. That makes sense. The sequels are batting 0 for 0 right now. The very first sentence slaps the audience in the face. Oh, you wanted to see the aftermath and destruction of the Empire? You wanted to see how Luke lives life after proving that no one is beyond redemption? You wanted to see Han and Leia live out as a couple? Too bad, the Empire's back, Luke's gone, go fuck yourself. Now while this isn't a good start, it isn't unsalvageable. The fact that after everything the Empire is back actually does mean something for the world, and it functions as world building for the audience. No matter how many times our good guys blow up the Death Star, the Empire will just rise from the ashes, which sets us up for an interesting direction for the story to take. We learn after this title crawl that the Empire is just never going to stay down. It can't be destroyed, at least not physically. 
Finally, we get to an actual scene in the movie where we get to meet our first guy in the main character group, Poe Dameron, played by the sexiest and sweatiest Spider-Man, Oscar Isaac. Now, Poe doesn't get much in this scene, or in this movie, but here's what's important. When held captive by our new main bad guy, Kylo Ren, Poe responds with humor to compose himself and defuse the situation, setting him up to be the sort of jokey guy. So when this character makes jokes, it won't be out of character. That doesn't mean that the jokes are going to be good, it just means that it's not bad writing. The other main guy introduced in this scene is the aforementioned Kylo Ren, aka Ben Solo. That part's a bit of a spoiler. And, um... Hey, wait a minute. That guy kind of just looks like Vader. Hey. This dude's just a cheap ripoff. Ha, <laughs> just kidding. That's the whole point. He is just stealing from Vader. We'll get more into that later. The next main character we get to see is this random stormtrooper having a panic attack and for sure getting some serious trauma right now. Damn, that's pretty rough, buddy. Hey, remember earlier when I talked about how I thought this movie was going to humanize the dark side a bit? This scene did not help. Anyway, the big thing going on right now is that this droid needs to get to the rebellion. So it's traveling through the desert carrying a map to Luke Skywalker, and that's where it'll stumble into our next main character, Rey. We get to see Rey in this badass scavenger outfit that we will literally never see again, and this is where I think this movie really does show promise. We see some gorgeous wide shots of the Jakku Desert, we see Rey living her life as a miserable and poor scavenger, and most notably, we see how she wants to join the rebellion. And we get all of this with barely any dialogue. Scenes like this are where I think this trilogy as a whole really shines. We've already seen this universe go through war and villains, and then we got to see the heroes rise up and defeat the villains, and now, how does the world react after? I think it makes perfect sense that our main character is someone who idolizes people like Luke. And in a way, she becomes a self-insert for the audience because we idolize Luke. Back on the bad guy ship, we get to see more of Poe and Kylo, where Kylo gets to use his Force Mind Pry ability to great effect. And then we see that Stormtrooper again, who's for sure got some serious trauma right now. And because of this trauma, the Stormtrooper decides to free Poe so he can escape and leave the Empire. And they both make a daring escape from the bad guy ship, and Poe gives the Stormtrooper a name, calling him Finn after his Stormtrooper name starting with the letters F and N. That's pretty neat. Now, I'm warning you now so you don't get disappointed. There is, in fact, no kissing scene between Oscar Isaac and John Boyega. Yeah, yeah, I know. I cried over it, too. I personally would have paid good money to see it, but instead all Disney cares about is their straight agenda. And that's more or less all of Poe's screen time in this movie. I guess the writers just thought that we have too many plot lines going on right now, and they need to pretend that Poe is dead for a bit. It's fine. It gives us more time to develop our other three main characters. No, I'm not counting the ball as a character. Finn travels the desert to find Rey and BB-8. He tells her that he's with the Resistance. He's lying. Hijinks ensue as stormtroopers chase them, and as they escape, they find a parked ship and... Hey, is that the Millennium Falcon? That's Han Solo and Chewbacca's ship. From the movie that I like. You, you remember the movie, right? I'm sure there's a great explanation for the, how that got here. Then there's some classic Star Wars chasing where we get to see how Rey is good with tech and thereby pretty decent at flying. Alright, maybe a little too good at flying, but let's just chalk that up to them needing a cool chase scene and a little luck. Now that our cool and well-introduced main characters escape from the bad guys, they can make it to the Resistance and do some cool story stuff. Wait, holy shit, is that Han Solo and Chewbacca? What are they doing here? They're from the movie that I like, remember? You remember from the movie, right? This movie's awesome, they're bringing back all the cool guys. Han and Chewie decide to take our new characters to a place where they can get a new ship that they'll definitely use and for sure need. But before that, we need more action. Here's some aliens and bad guys for Han and Chewie to fight. Wow, that was so cool. I can't wait to see more of those random bad guys since they were important enough to be put here. Hey, let's check up on our bad guys, shall we? We've got General Ginger, Kylo Ren, and Supreme Leader Snoke. Now, one of these bad guys is done really weird. Remember earlier how I said the whole point of Kylo Ren was that he was stealing from Vader? like, regarding his style at least. 
Well, does Snoke remind you of anyone? Any other gross old men coming to mind? Well, they're coming in my mind. <laughs> anyway, unlike Kylo Ren, who actually has a reason to be copycat, Snoke is kind of just a shameless ripoff of Palpatine, and spoiler alert for the rest of the series, that's all he ever is. We barely learn anything else about Snoke, and all he does is act as the evil emperor and sit on his throne until... Well, we'll get to whenever he who shall not be named somehow returns. Also, who are those Knights of Ren guys? They sound pretty cool. So what's really notable about this scene is that we've learned that Kylo Ren is currently fighting within himself, trying to resist the light side of the Force. He seeks guidance from Snoke and the destroyed helmet of his old grandfather, Vader. This setup of a dark side user trying to resist the light side from corrupting him is actually kind of a neat twist on the whole corruption trope, and it sets up Kylo Ren's arc in the story perfectly. Unfortunately, it is soiled slightly by one thing. Everyone seems to miss the point of Darth Vader in this trilogy. He changed at the end, and sure, you can argue that he never fully got redeemed, but he proved Luke right in that no one was beyond redemption. At the end, he made the choice of family over power, which is sort of like the antithesis to everything the Sith hold dear. Knowing that, the fact that Kylo Ren idolizes Darth Vader kind of makes it feel like his sacrifice never even really happened. Moving on from that, we need to see our main characters again. Han takes Rey and Finn to a rip-off cantina where we meet my least favorite character in the trilogy, Bar Lady. That isn't her actual name, I just don't remember what it is, but given this series track record, it's probably something like Gunkle Farda. Hey CJ, why do you hate the Bar Lady so much? Why are you asking me such a dumb question? The long and short of it is that she just sort of knows everything about the main characters, without any explanation other than the fact that she's a couple thousand years old. And that's all the backstory we get from her. And she proceeds to be annoying and unfunny throughout not only this movie, but the whole trilogy. Also, she considers Chewbacca to be her boyfriend and like, guys, what are we doing here? Why are we giving Chewbacca a girlfriend? And why has it gotta be Gunkle Farta? Speaking of this dumb character that doesn't make any sense, guess what she has lying around in her basement? Oh, it's nothing big. It's just the lost lightsaber of Luke and Anakin Skywalker. Hey CJ, how did she get that lightsaber? Well, according to her, that is a great question. A good question for another time. That it? Oh, okay, I guess that's it. Are you good? I'm good. I think that's all we need. It better be all we need, because it's all we will ever get. Anyway, Rey finds the lightsaber down here after some pointless dialogue with Finn that doesn't matter to the story at all, and then boom, holy shit, she sees visions of the Jedi Temple burning, and Luke Skywalker, and, and R2-D2, and her parents leaving her. Um, by the way, it's been a bit of a thing for Rey. She's waiting for her parents to come back and pick her up. It's been established before, I just haven't really found a good place to talk about it. Then the bar lady tries to talk Rey into becoming a Jedi because Gunkle Farta can sense the Force in her. Why not? She's a thousand years old, might as well make her a Force-sensitive person too. Cut to the most subtle Nazi imagery ever put to film, where General Ginger explains their plan to destroy the Republic that's only ever been mentioned once before this, and that we've literally never seen. And then, the Starkiller base blows up the solar system with its giant laser beam. Hey, remember Elderon in that one movie you guys like? Remember how the Death Star blows that up? Well, this one's like that, but it blows up a solar system instead, and it's the size of a planet instead of a moon, because it's so epic and cute. Of course, them initiating this attack also leads to the Empire sending fighters to go attack Rey and Finn so that they can find BB-8. Now that the main group is under attack, we get to see more of Finn's awesome fighting skills. Plus, he's wielding a lightsaber! Finn gets a badass, expertly choreographed fight scene with this stormtrooper right here, trading blows, exchanging cutthroat and quips, and... Oh. Oh, Finn's down. Oh, he's about to die. Oh, no. No, he's safe. Okay. Good thing Han was there to uh, save him. Side note, I always thought that this stormtrooper that we see right here was just like a random nameless guy, but apparently he's actually like in some comics and has his own actual name and stuff. He's got a whole article about him on Wikipedia. I just thought that was really weird. 
Anyway. Something this movie does that I find uncomfortable is how Finn is so okay with killing stormtroopers, to the point of cheering whenever an X-Wing blows up a group of them. I, I just don't really get what the writers were going for here. Like, did they forget that Finn was also a stormtrooper? What justification could he possibly have for cheering in joy while watching the people that he was like die? I, I can excuse other characters cheering when stormtroopers die, given the fact that to them, they're just faceless baddies. But Finn was literally one of them. He knows for a fact that stormtroopers aren't irredeemable because he was redeemed. Every time a stormtrooper dies, he should recognize that it could have been him. And yet what we get is this. Also, during this attack, Rey is captured by Kylo Ren, who, for some reason, chooses to let BB-8 go back to the Rebels. I know that they say that all they need is Rey, but BB-8 also has the data. If they let BB-8 go back to the Rebels, then the Rebels will also be able to find Luke. Wouldn't Kylo Ren want to stop that? Also, how is Kylo going to transfer the data of the map from Rey's mind into any usable form of map? Do, do they have a cartographer on standby just ready to write down it as Kylo Ren describes it? Cut back to the Resistance where it's revealed to Finn that Poe is still alive! Surprise! Anyway, we don't have time for them pretending to give us a gay love story. We need to get back to the straights! Here's where we find out that Leia and Han have been separated, and we get a little bit of backstory on what caused Kylo Ren to turn to the dark side. Yeah, I, I guess that counts. Sure. Are we not literally never going to hear anything else about who Snoke is? We we roll with the punches here, all right? The, and this movie has been throwing a lot of punches. Also, don't forget, C-3PO has a new arm. Did you see it? Look at his new arm. It's so important. Look at it. All right, good thing you got to see that before they replace it in the next movie. So remember in those other movies you like, how there was a Death Star? Well, this one's bigger. And... It still has that same singular explosion weak point that'll cause it to blow up. Like the whole planet will just blow up if a little bitty bomb gets sent in there. So obviously the plan is to go there and shoot the big dumb weak point. But oh no, the planet has shields so ships can't go in or out. So, but the shields, don't worry though, don't worry, because the shields won't block something that's going through light speed. So Han has a plan, and his plan is to use good old-fashioned reaction time to just light speed through the shields and then pop back. This movie does this a lot where it just kind of invents problems for the characters to have and then comes up with solutions in the next second. And I don't, I just don't really get why they do this. Why not just not have these problems to begin with? Or if you really need the problems, have them come up with real solutions? I just, I feel like this is a little dumb. Characters are just like, oh no, we have to do this. And then another character says, let's just do this. And then we go on to the next problem. At this point, there are only really two interesting characters left, Rey and Kylo Ren. So let's check up on them. Kylo Ren does some mind peeking using the force. He's just poking around in there, getting a little peek into what Rey is thinking about. And here, we actually kind of get a bit of Cool foreshadowing for the next movie. Kylo Ren says that he sees that Rey dreams of an island with her heroes on it. It's something that'll come up later. It's actually kind of neat. Kylo has a bit of trouble peering into Rey's mind palace, though. So he goes away to unwind for a bit, and that, of course, gives Rey a chance to enact her great escape. Now, some people have a problem with Rey using force mind control on this poor weary soul after never practicing it or any other force ability. However, We've been shown that some Force users are great at some techniques and terrible at others. For example, Rey has been shown to be unable to lift things with the Force at all. And she isn't good at detecting things like locations either, so maybe mind control is just what she's good at. And on top of that, in this universe, Stormtroopers are kind of like easy mode when it comes to mind control. I mean, look at that sexy little guy. I could probably mind control him if I just shake my ass enough. <laughs> it's fucking stupid. Anyway, Rey makes it out like a bandit and is now running loose on the ship. We cut to Han, Chewie, and Finn, who were dealing with someone who might as well just be a random stormtrooper, and lowering the planet's shields. Oh, CJ, how dare you consider Captain Phasma to just be a random stormtrooper? I'm gonna get more into it later, but honestly, 
Captain Phasma sucks. She's a boring character, and they never do anything with her in this movie or in the second one, so I don't care about her. So then they all wander around until they stumble into Rey, who's doing a terrible job hiding, before... <gasps> What's this? Kylo Ren! He's found them! Oh no, the drama! Thankfully though, Han Solo is here to talk down his son. While it is sort of set up in a clever way with the expertly delivered line, I know what I have to do, but I don't know if I have the strength to do it. Being a bit of a twist, making you think he's referring to betraying Snoke when he's really talking about killing his father, the scene is ruined by how obvious the twist is. There's barely any subtlety. The lighting becomes like a dark red shining on absolutely everything. It feels like they're trying to just kind of clue you in on what's about to happen, but it's just so dragged out and obvious that it makes me want to yell at my screen. Just kill your damn dad already, dude! I'm not sure if I need to say this, but if your movie is making me yell at my screen for someone to commit patricide, then something's wrong. Now we get the final showdown with Kylo Ren versus Finn and Rey, which happens in the forest. Snowy, it's very cinematic. Now, let me preface this by saying, yes, the choreography is very well done. I like how the fight looks, but let's talk about the outcomes of the fight. Personally, I'm really happy that Finn gets his ass handed to him in this fight, and I'm even okay with the fact that Rey kind of holds her own. Where I think the story leans on contrivance though is when Rey, a girl who's never held a lightsaber before, just straight up destroys Kylo Ren in a one-on-one -on -one fight. He's like a Sith Lord that's been training since childhood under Luke Skywalker and Emperor Snoke, and he's beaten by Rey. Once again, someone who's never held the lightsaber before. It just doesn't really make any sense to me, no matter how you slice it. And I understand that they need Rey and Finn to escape this battle because, you know, story. But I feel like it would have made more sense for them to escape because, you know, the planet's blowing up and not because Rey beats the living shit out of Kylo Ren for some reason. Speaking of the planet blowing up, Poe does his job as the pilot of the group and sends his big ol' nasty bombs into the Star Killer's big dumb weak spot. Ooh, now that's a critical hit. <laughs> that show is so fucking stupid. That's a critical. <clears throat> That's great. The planet starts to explode, naturally as every planet does when you blow up a reactor on it, and they go to pick up Rey and Finn before piecing out of there. Now, you may be wondering, weren't there like three main bad guys on that planet that's, um, blown up that show up in the next movie? Yep. Fortunately for them, though, they had planet explosion and resistance armor, something you'll find out has actually been a thing since the original trilogy. So all those bad guys were actually fine. Do not worry about it. Everything's good. Nevertheless, everyone gets right on to celebrating, except Rey. She has to go out and find Luke Skywalker, who turns around dramatically before the credits roll. And that's The Force Awakens. Was it as bad as I remember? I kind of think it was worse. I really liked the first 30 minutes, but after Han shows up, it feels like all the dialogue kind of gets inhuman and the plot loses its pace. Things just happen and happen without ever stopping to let the audience absorb information. Also, we get constant mindless action that makes analysis of the movie nearly impossible because there's nothing going on. The few moments that could even be seen as passable art are almost immediately ruined by how unsubtle the cinematography is, or how corny the dialogue is. Pile that on with some gross plot contrivances and poorly explained details, and all around I think we just have a bad movie. Fortunately though, this next movie seems to show promise, being written by a completely different person and everything. So without further ado, here is The Last Jedi. And the real reason I wanted to make this video. We open this movie to find that the Rebel base has been revealed, and the First Order's fleet is orbiting the planet, ready to fire down on them. And to deal with this, our favorite pilot in the galaxy, not including Han, Anakin, Luke, Chewbacca, Lando, or that one guy from Rogue One, is sent down there to stall. While he's sent to stall, we get to see some of Poe's established humor, and yeah, I know he isn't funny, but it's not out of character, and that's all I care about. 
We also get some great action with Poe actually being able to show off to the audience how he's one of the best pilots in the galaxy, something we were told last movie, but we barely got to see it all. Once Poe has kept the badass dreadnought ship distracted, Leia tells him to fall back so they can all escape. But Poe sees this as an opportunity for the rebels to score a real victory, so he calls for backup. Bombers arrive on the scene, and can I just say, I love the design of these bomber ships. They just look so weird and cool. One massive problem with them though is the amount of surface area on this ship that just has explosives all over it means that one tiny little laser hitting the broadside of a space barn is all it takes for the ship to just go up in flames. Plenty of lasers do indeed hit those space barns as all but one of the bomber fleet is destroyed before they can deploy their bombs, along with dozens of other ships. As all hope seems lost, we follow the last bomber ship, watching its pilots struggle to deploy the bombs, but at the last second, she manages to press the button and release the bombs and we get satisfying little of all the bombs. That's the sound of the bombs falling. If you watch the movie, you'll get it because that's the sound that the bombs make when they fall. It's just you get it. It's the sound they make. We cut to Poe and we see him actually act like a person. This is such a breath of fresh air when compared to Poe just ordered the death of dozens of his comrades. And though they succeeded in their plan, most people there lost their lives. You know what? I'll let Leia explain it herself because she really gets it better than anyone. There were heroes on that mission. Dead heroes. No leaders. See, unlike the last movie, Poe actually has an arc in this movie. And spoiler alert, it's awesome. I'll get more into it later, but it revolves around this idea. Poe valuing martyrdom over the bigger picture. If Poe wants to lead the rebellion, he needs to learn that sometimes you can't afford sacrifices. Poe gets officially demoted by Leia here so that he can learn his lesson better, and then the rebels jump to hyperspace to escape the First Order. But what's this? The First Order can track them through hyperspace? Oh no! Well, the rebels are in quite a pickle, huh? Speaking of pickles, Finn's been catching some Z's over here in the sauna bed while all of this has been going down. Once he wakes up, he exchanges some great dialogue with Poe. You must have a thousand questions. Where's Ray? Yeah, I, I love that right there. We learned in the last movie about how attached to Ray Finn is. And at this point, he really doesn't have anything else to deal with here. So anything going on with the rebels, such as the spaceships blowing up, is superficial to him in comparison to where Rey is. Speaking of Rey, where is she? Well, if you remember at the end of the last movie, I wouldn't blame you if you didn't, at this point it was years ago, she's with Luke. Finally, we get to see what's really been going on with our wise, badass main dude. He takes back his lightsaber, ready to fight for the rebels, and... Oh, oh, I think he dropped it on accident. You gonna go pick it up, Luke? You know, you're just gonna walk away? All right, well, that's weird. That doesn't really sound like Luke to me. Something's going on with this guy and I am not into it. This guy barely even seems like a Jedi, much less Luke Skywalker. All right, cut the shit. Let me run down what's going on with Luke and why I think it works. I'm a bit of a loser, so I read comic books from time to time. And I don't know if any of you have ever read comic books, but sometimes they are awful. Yeah, like that one. And I mean, really awful. And what happens sometimes when a story is so awful that a writer will come along and try to undo it? Spider-Man has this awful story where they bring back Kraven the Hunter after his cinematic and amazing death in Kraven's Last Hunt. And not one Marvel fan liked this. And so years later, they were still trying to just undo Kraven being brought back instead of just building upon it. At this point, you might be seeing where I'm going with this. The Force Awakens set up Luke Skywalker to be someone who, when things got tough, ran away and hid. The Luke we know would never just run away and hide from his problems, but that's the Luke we were given. And instead of just trying to undo that, the writers of The Last Jedi took that idea and decided to run with it. So the Luke we get in this movie isn't exactly what we wanted, but just the fact that it's consistent with the previous movie is something that should be praised. On top of that, the arc we are given for Luke is something satisfying. And given the fact that 
this Luke is the Luke they had to work with, I think they did it the best they could. Obviously, I'll talk more about Luke later, but this should satiate you lunatics until then. So we've seen three of our four main characters so far. Remember those being Rey, Finn, Poe, and Kylo. The ball doesn't count. Let's check up on our fourth main character. We see Kylo Ren on his way to talk to Emperor Snoke in his throne room. Is that really Kylo Ren? Huh. Look, look at the camera angle here. That's just straight up Darth Vader. Can we appreciate here the cinematography? The way the shots are angled makes the audience mistake Kylo Ren for Darth Vader, drawing an even closer connection between the two of them before they get ripped apart. Snow confronts Kylo Ren about how he's lost in a fight to Rey, and he really just digs into him. I mean, listen to this. You're just a child. In the mask. Like... I, I don't know about you, but if someone said that to me, I just cry right there. Tears are flowing on the spot. This is also such a pivotal moment for Kylo Ren. He's been beaten, scolded, and humiliated, but above all else, his worst fears have been realized. He is nothing like Darth Vader. His mask serves as nothing but a cheap cosplay. He's lived his life pretending to be like Vader, hoping he can rely on his force choking and cool helmet to get in the way there. But when the chips were down, he failed and the mask serves as an insult to both him and Vader. So in a fit of rage, he destroys it. He pummels it into the side of an elevator until it's nothing more than scraps. At this moment, Kylo Ren has decided to stop pretending he's Vader, which gives him the freedom to become something greater. Let's quickly look at what's going on on the island that Luke lives on. We've got some weird frog nuns. I think they look funny. They're friend-shaped. Big fan, personally. Next, we've got Porgs. Now, Porgs get a lot of shit for being made just to sell toys. And like, yeah, they were absolutely made just to sell toys. But so was General Grievous, so and he's awesome. We briefly see Luke's X-Wing in the water. I just think that's a cool shot right there. And finally, the most important thing we see are these uh, ugly space cows. Why are the ugly space cows important? Well, let's take a look at what they produce. Anyone else see that? That's blue milk right there. Look familiar? Luke's always been a fan of blue milk. When he exiles himself, he's going to take a little slice of home with him. He's been drinking that shit since he was on Tatooine. He loves blue milk. It looks tasty. I mean, come on. You love the blue. You love to see it. It's blue milk. Come on. Who isn't a fan of blue milk? Back on the rebel fleet, Poe's ship gets blown up, causing a counterattack to be impossible. On top of this, Kylo Ren and his stormtroopers blow up the starboard hangar, leading to the unfortunate death of a true rebel hero, Admiral Akbar. His name will live on in the hearts of all rebels until the end of time. Godspeed, Akbar. May the force be with you. Also, Leia was on the ship too, but she's fine, so don't worry about her. Now, I'm not going to dwell on it too much because there are a lot more shots where it's a lot more obvious, but look at the cinematography here. I don't care what any of you think. I think this is beautiful. It's just, it's just gorgeous. I don't know. I love it. Now, something this trilogy gets a lot of flack over is how often it resorts to fan service. And while I do think it's worthy of criticism for that, moments like this... Ooh, this makes me feel some shit. Forget the fact that it's fan service for a second and think about it in the world. Luke lived his life suffering under the Empire because the few good men that were left lived in hiding instead of saving the galaxy. Luke knows what it's like more than anyone to be all alone with no one to save you. So he realizes that he is their only hope right now. And so just as his old master did, he decides to help. Back on the Rebel base once again, we're introduced to another heated topic among this trilogy, Admiral Holdo. Since Leia is out of commission, Admiral Holdo is in control of the fleet. And while she gives a very moving speech here, Poe isn't convinced she's what the Rebels need. Now, this scene is really just here to establish the conflict between Poe and Holdo, but just from this alone, we get a clear understanding of the motivations of both characters. Poe thinks Admiral Holdo's plan is to just bide their time and let the rebels slowly die out, 
Meanwhile, Holdo sees the stunt Poe just pulled a second ago and thinks that right now he's reckless at best and straight up dangerous at worst. So even though we don't know Holdo's plan, we do know that Poe has already gotten people killed with his antics. You know who's barely gotten anyone killed though? Finn. Down in the basement of the Rebels' main ship, we get to see that Finn is trying to escape the fleet to find Rey and make sure she's safe. Once again, the writers of this movie really get what we were given here with Finn and play into his character. Finn has wanted two things in the series so far, to make sure Rey is safe and to get the hell out of there. Unfortunately for him, the escape pods are being guarded by the ship's mechanic. Hey wait, that lady's got the same uh, pendant as the bomber pilot from a second- you remember the bomber pilot from a second ago? This lady has the same pendant. I, they're probably related in some way. And the funny thing is, she didn't even have to say that out loud and we as the audience understood that. Wordless storytelling is something that I'm always super happy when writers use. In real life, we don't always explain every detail of every situation because there's no audience to exposition dump to that we know of. So conveying information to the audience using props and facial expressions? Yeah, like that. It brings us into the world more because it feels like how information would be conveyed to us in real life. After their meetup, Rose and Finn come up with a plan to stop the First Order's ship from tracking the Rebels through light speed. Basically, they need to get onto the ship and deactivate the tracker. Unfortunately, the hard part of that plan is getting onto the ship. Thankfully, Poe knows someone who can help with this. Oh no, oh no, 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 come on. Okay, so now they need to go to a random planet with a casino to find a hacker that Gunkle Farden knows so that they can go onto the ship so that they can deactivate the tracker so that the rebels can escape. Sound convoluted? It is. Finn and Rose's subplot is easily the weakest part of this movie for me. We'll get into the details about it in a bit, but while Poe, Rey, and Kylo have full arcs in this story that they go on, with plenty of things for them to do and things to contribute to the overall plot, Finn gets sidelined in this movie to have mindless action scenes. Now, I'm not saying Finn has no purpose in this movie, I still do think he has an arc, it's just very weak when compared to the other main characters. Finn's subplot really just can't compare to the main plot we currently have going on with Rey especially when we get amazing scenes like this one. We see Rey and Kylo doing their own things separately while the music builds up slowly. The camera keeps them at opposite ends of the frame and then it's silence. We can see that their eyes are connected and we know that somehow in some way they can see each other. Rey panics and shoots Kylo, breaking them both from the connection. This scene has barely any dialogue and it doesn't show the characters in the same room, and yet the audience can perfectly understand what's happening just by the camera work and sound design. Mwah. Great scene. It sets up the four Skype calls that we're going to be seeing throughout the movie. Also, goddamn, Adam Driver can get it in this movie. Objectifying is okay when it's men. That's a joke, it's not. Don't do it. Once Rey has collected herself from that encounter, she meets up with Luke for her first day of training. Luke asks Rey what she thinks the Force is, and her answer makes perfect sense for someone that's never actually talked to a Jedi before. When you think about it, all she's really ever heard about the Force is that it's a great weapon used by the Jedi. Rey grew up idolizing people like Luke, but given where she lived, she never had an opportunity to actually learn about something as complex as the Force. In fact, at this point, most of the audience might even have a flawed understanding of what the Force is. The Force is not a power you have. It's not about lifting rocks. It's the energy between all things, the tension, the balance that binds the universe together. Okay. You hear that shit? That's, that's great. That, that's wise as hell. This is the perfect way to explain the force. Get that middle chlorine shit out of here. We don't want it. It's dumb. This, this is what I want. I want more mystical mumbo jumbo. The Force is nature and everything in between, it's balance. Oh, hearing this coming from Luke also serves to remind the audience that while he isn't the wise Luke we remember, he is still there somewhere. We do have a wise sage to teach us, it's just Jiraiya instead of Ugwe. While Rey is reaching out trying to understand the Force, she feels something on the island calling to her, pulling her and she feels the dark side of the force. As Kylo was being pulled to the side of the light, 
Ray is being pulled by the side of the dark. The darkness on the island piques Ray's curiosity, and she can't help but seek it out. This causes some weird magic shit to happen, and Luke freaks out. He gets mad at her for not even trying to resist the dark side. And now, Rey has something that she wants to learn that Luke is unwilling to teach her, causing just the slightest wedge to be driven between her and Luke. This scene unknowingly brings Rey closer to Kylo, now that they both have started to drift from their original standings as the light and dark sides of the Force. Luke continues to train Rey, and we see a quick little montage of her practicing with her lightsaber. And then Luke gives Rey a talking to about why the Jedi were a failure. He goes on about how if it weren't for the Jedi, Darth Sidious would never have risen to power, and that it's because of the Jedi that Darth Vader turned to the dark side. And while Rey tries to change his mind, he's kind of right. Think about the prequels real quick. The Jedi Order was filled with around a thousand Jedi, and the Sith had two. The Jedi had the nerve to claim there was balance in the Force when there was anything but. Then look at Anakin. All Anakin wanted was to be married to the love of his life, but the Jedi Order refused to let him marry her because she would be an earthly possession. This was the biggest motivator Anakin had to betray the Jedi. So when you look at it, they are what caused Darth Vader to rise. And Darth Vader turning evil is what caused Darth Sidious to rise to power. Rey, of course, claims that the Jedi aren't evil, as it was a Jedi that saw the good in Darth Vader and brought him back over to the light. And in response to this, Luke explains how he hasn't always managed to save those who've turned to the dark side. And we get our first of three tellings of what happened on the night when Kylo Ren turned to the dark side and burned down the Jedi Temple. In this telling, Luke straight up lies about what happens, and Rey completely believes him. I mean, to be fair, she has no reason not to. And she assures Luke that he and the Jedi are both still good. Now the movie needs to remind you that it isn't perfect, as we cut back to Finn and Rose's story. They show up on the casino planet, park on a beach because they need to get arrested later, fart around in the casino for a bit before, you guessed it, they get arrested. Now since they can't find the Master Codebreaker, they need to look for a new solution. And the new soulmate they were given in casino jail happens to be this guy. He's, uh... He's evil. I'm not gonna beat around the bush here. It's so easy to see that he's gonna betray them. The entire time, all he talks about is how he doesn't side with anyone, how both sides are actually bad, and how he's just gonna live his life no matter what. And if anyone ever talks to you like this, just recognize they suck, they're terrible. Centrists go to hell. Honestly, my two biggest issues with Finn and Rose's subplot is that one, it feels like it's just here to pad the runtime and keep the audience's attention with action. Like, do we really need this? We need this, really? And two, the whole theme here doesn't really fit with the movie. DJ is talking about how both sides of the war aren't good and how weapon sellers will just sell to whoever, and Rose is talking about how the weapon sellers are unethical and treat people poorly. And the whole concept is just really basic and uninteresting to me. Pile that on with the fact that we have no real relation to the rest of the movie, other than they need to get onto the ship and that's why they're doing all of this. It just doesn't really fit. If it were me, I would have just put Finn and Rose's subplot on the Dreadnought skip them having to get there and just have the plot be there. But I don't work at Disney, so I probably won't ever either. I just want to say as well, um, I don't care what you guys think. I think this movie has tons of moments of being incredibly funny. Yeah, the purposeful jokes kind of suck, but look at this. Do you have something, a cowl or something you could put on? Like, it's just, it's just so funny to me. He gets asked to put a shirt on, completely ignores request. Like, he's just so base, Ben Solo forever. Kylo Ren then proceeds to tell Rey how she's weak because she has parental issues. True. And we get our second telling of what happened on the night where Kylo Ren burned down the Jedi Temple. Now, this story is just as inaccurate as the first time we heard it, but Kylo isn't knowingly lying this time. This is what Kylo thought happened, but unfortunately, it was a misunderstanding of the real situation, which caused even more confusion. But upon learning Kylo's side of the story, Rey realizes that Luke lied to her, and she starts to wonder what else he lied about. So, 
she seeks out the depths of the island. Once Ray enters the depths, we get some very cool and trippy shots of like hundreds of mirrors of Ray doing the same thing she's doing, looking at her hand and snapping her fingers and stuff like that. And the audience is left in wonder as we get some amazing sound design. Isolating the noises Ray makes, the music slowly creeps up on us as she explores the cave. And when Ray reaches the end, we can feel the dark side reaching out to her. She asks who her parents are seeking to use the power of the dark side, and it does indeed answer. It's no one. Her parents aren't important. They aren't a part of who she is. What matters is her. This moment pulls Rey and Kylo closer together than ever before, causing them to confide in each other. Rey says to Kylo, it isn't too late which is a very interesting line because obviously it means it isn't too late for one of them to join the other. But after that encounter with the dark side, the audience isn't sure who'd be joining who. The audience doesn't get to know if them reaching out towards each other is triumphant or horrific, which builds up a sense of conflict in the audience, just like the conflict that Rey and Kylo are currently feeling. Luke walks in on the youngins doing some forced canoodling and he puts a stop to it right away, causing Rey to confront him on what actually happened that night when Kylo Ren was made. This is the third and final time we hear that story. This time we hear the truth. In his years of fame and admiration, Luke became attached to everything around him. He had become accustomed to being relished as a hero. So when he reaches out to Ben Solo to see the darkness in his mind, he sees that Ben possesses a risk to him, a risk to his life. Ben Solo could cause the death and destruction of thousands. So in an act of instinct, Luke slips. He thought for the briefest moment that maybe he could just get it done now. Maybe he could just take the easy way out and purge the darkness before it grows. Barely a few seconds later, it sinks in what he's considering. He's thinking about murdering his own nephew just out of fear that he might turn to the dark side. And Luke feels shame, shame that's entirely deserved. Even though Luke never killed Ben that night, even considering it as an option was failure. He was trusted to be the wise master of a new generation of Jedi. And in that moment, he let it all go to waste. Ben Solo saw his master standing over him ready to kill him, and Ben saw no other choice but to defend himself. Turning to the dark side of the Force after the light had so clearly failed him, he was lured in by the promise of a better life, and given what he's seen of his so-called good guys, he takes it. And Luke exiles himself in shame of his failures, and the galaxy falls deeper into chaos. This Luke Skywalker isn't the one we remember. He's far from it. This isn't a scrappy yet wise young man ready to forgive even the most irredeemable person because he believes that no one is beyond redemption. This is a sad, pathetic, weak old man who fails his pupil when he needed him the most. This Luke Skywalker is anything but the hero that we and Rey remembered. Because this Luke saw someone and thought, even if just for a second, that there was no chance that they could be redeemed. And that is the greatest failure he could possibly make. In this moment, we think that maybe Luke was right to hide away in shame. Maybe he was right to throw away the force. In the end, his fame and power is what caused him to fall. Rey sees who her hero truly is, and she's disappointed. Rightfully so. Luke wasn't perfect. And since Rey cannot be like him, she needs to be better than him. Rey decides to try to succeed where Luke failed and turn Kylo Ren back into Ben Solo. Once Rey has left the island, Luke goes to burn down the Jedi texts. And just as he's about to do it, he sees Yoda's Force Ghost. Once again, this trilogy has an issue with fan service. That being said, <laughs> I love this little guy. This Yoda is better than literally every scene we got of Yoda in the prequels. In this whole series, we've seen two different versions of Yoda. We've seen hardened battle Jedi general who orders clones to open fire with their machine guns on a bunch of people, and hee hee hoo hoo little goblin man Yoda, who, you know, hits you over the head with a stick and rolls around laughing. And let me just say, I like the goblin Yoda so much more. The Yoda we get here actually feels like Yoda from the original trilogy. He's kooky, weird, he's not gross CGI, and he actually is super wise. Listen to this. We are what they grow beyond. That 
is the true burden of all masters. That is just so wise, right? That left me that left me speechless the first time that I watched it. Like, come on. It, Prequel Yoda never said anything as wise as that. Prequel Yoda sucks. This guy's where I'm at. All right, we've been focused on Rey and Luke for too long. Let's catch up on Finn and Rose again. Mm. Can we uh, can we go back to Rey and Luke? All right, so these two fly their way into the Imperial ship with the help of the most obvious backstabber in the world. BB-8 pretends to be a gonk droid and... Oh no, they've been betrayed. Listen. I'm not saying that you're dumb if you couldn't see this coming, but what I am saying is that I was in middle school when this came out, and I saw this coming. So one of us has to be an outlier. Also, I know this is a little nitpicky, but DJ takes Rose's pendant for a second, which makes us think that he's being an asshole, but then he just gives it back, which makes us think he isn't an asshole, he just needed it for the thing. But then he betrays them, so what was the point in doing that? Why not just have him keep the pendant or not ask for it? I don't get what the point of that was. While this has all been going on, we've been seeing brief glimpses of what the rebels are dealing with. Burning fuel and losing support ships one by one. Poe having to sit by and watch this gets combative with Admiral Holda, only to find out that her plan is for the rebels to abandon ship into a group of unarmed transports. Poe sees Holdo as being a coward, but Holdo sees Poe as being reckless. This conflict is super compelling because Poe does have reason to be upset at Holdo, since from his perspective, all she's doing is making a futile escape attempt. Holdo, however, has plenty of reason to not tell Poe her plan, as all she's seen of him is someone who wants to be a hero and take out as much of the Empire as he can. This whole situation results in a full-on mutiny, where Poe overthrows Holdo so the rebels can make a final all-out fight against the Empire. This plan is of course interrupted when Leia wakes up and tases the living shit out of Poe. When Poe finally comes to, he finds out that Holdo's plan was actually for the rebels to sneak off to a nearby abandoned rebel base, and that Holdo is planning on sacrificing herself to distract the Empire. This is what Poe's conflict has been about. If he wants to be the leader of the Resistance, then he needs to learn that sometimes going out in a blaze of glory is worse than cowering and running. If Poe approaches every encounter with the intent of fighting, he'll lose more and more soldiers until there's no one left. So with this in mind, and Holdo ready to sacrifice herself, Poe learns who he needs to be, and now he just needs to act on it. Rey has finally made it back to the Resistance, and she is immediately captured by Kylo Ren and brought to Snoke's throne room. I want to mention really quickly, I actually really like Snoke in this movie much more than in The Force Awakens. His writing and acting work together to create an actually gross and intimidating villain, unlike the Sheev clone he was in the last one. Rey tries to fight back against Snoke and fails it, like, every single time, which shows the difference of power between both of them. Snoke presents Rey to be killed by Kylo, giving him a speech to rile him up, and boy, this speech is great. Every line Snoke gives is true in some sense, heir apparent to Lord Vader. He is, but not because he's the true Lord of Darkness, but because there's redemption in his heart. Where there was conflict, I now sense resolve. That's also true, there is resolve but the resolve to turn against Snoke, not to abandon the light. And Kylo Ren delivers this amazing line once more. I know what I, know what I have, to, have do. to do. But this time, he's not saying to kill his dad. He's talking about betraying Snoke. I see him turning, turning the, the lightsaber to strike, strike true. true. And he does obviously strike true, and he kills his true enemy. Not his rival in the Force, but his master who forged a connection between Kylo Ren and Rey. His master thought he could convince Kylo to kill the only person who ever truly saw him. In the end, Snoke's own arrogance is what gets him killed, and Kylo Ren is just the one that pulls the trigger. This moment leads to hands down the best choreographed fight scene in this trilogy, and easily one of the best in the whole series. Rey and Kylo fighting the Imperial Guards really lets us see what Kylo's true strength is, and Rey gets to put some of her training to the test too. The designs of these guards is also so cool, they all have unique, cool little weapons. It feels like the fight with the Imperial Guards we never got to see in the first trilogy. I always really wanted to watch these red guys just duke it out with someone, like actually hard duke it out. This scene really scratched that itch for me. I mean, fucking look at this, look at this! I mean, tell me that's not awesome. That is awesome. That's sick as hell, dude. And now that Rey and Kylo are safe, we can get the best scene 
in the whole trilogy. Let old things die. This is what this movie is about. The old ways have failed. The Jedi brought the Sith, the Sith bring the Jedi. It never ends. No matter how many Death Stars they blow up, the Empire will always rise from the ashes. The only way this ends is if both sides join. At least that's how Kylo Ren sees it. Kylo asks Rey to join him. She asks him not to go down this road. Please don't go this way. No, no, you're still holding on! Let go! Rey still isn't willing to join him because what he wants isn't the real answer. He wants the easy way out. Kylo wants to meet in the middle, a grave side of the force, a mix of empire and rebels, when in reality that would still mean compromising. It would mean taking away some of the good. Rey has seen her master turn his back on the galaxy. Luke faltered. Rey knows she can't do the same. So even if it is the easiest answer, Rey refuses to join Kylo Ren. Frustrated by Rey's response, Kylo delivers the reveal that Rey is not Leia's daughter or Luke's daughter. She's not the descendant of some great Force user. She's nobody. Her parents were nothing. They're filthy junk traders who sold you off for drinking money. They did. In a pauper's grave in the Jakku Desert. You have no place in this story. You come from nothing. You're nothing. With the knowledge that Rey's parents have no place in her story, Rey is given the opportunity to let go. She doesn't have to be a nobody. She can rise above her family lineage and be great anyway. Rey isn't strong because her bloodline is strong. She's strong because greatness can come from anywhere in the galaxy. And so Rey refuses to take Kylo's hand, instead reaching for Luke's lightsaber. And so begins the tug and pull. Rey and Kylo Ren pull on Luke and Anakin's lightsaber, both fighting for control to reclaim their old idol. The battle is equal in strength because, as Snoke said, rises and light to meet it. Neither can get a hold of the saber, and it starts to splinter. Letting the old ways die has been a big part of this movie, and here's where it reaches its head. Kylo Ren destroyed his helmet, resolving to not try to be the new Vader, and instead being himself allowing him the ability to rise greater heights than even Vader ever did. Rey saw the disappointment that Luke had become, and instead of putting her hope in him, she chose to rise above him and be the galaxy's hope herself. She vows to not be the new Luke. So the lightsaber snaps. Vader, Luke, gone. Both Rey and Kylo have already chosen to be better than their idols, and in this moment is the point of no return. Now Rey has no one else to fall back on, and Kylo Ren has no one else to live in the shadow of. The old ways are dead, and our two main characters have killed them. Now, let's talk about the Holdo Maneuver. It's cut between the scenes that I just talked about, and all that can really be said about this is... It's stunning. I don't care about the physics of it, even though I do think it makes sense, I think trying to ask questions about how it works and why doesn't every ship do it, it it'd be missing the forest for the trees. I know we're watching a fun sci-fi romp, but I mean, look at that, man. That I'm not even a big Star Wars fan, and I'd frame that on my wall. That's how damn gorgeous this thing is. I've talked about it before, but this is really where the movie shows off its skills. The cinematography and sound design in this scene is masterful. It's m immaculate. Just as the music builds up to its crescendo, we go silent. As the ship moves to light speed, the theater turns quiet as the whole Empire fleet is ripped to shreds. And after a moment of awe, we hear the explosion. Like after the sound travels slower than light when watching fireworks, we have this moment of anticipation waiting for the boom. And when we get it, boy is it electric. So at this point, I'm sure some of you are wondering why I haven't really talked about what's widely considered to be a pretty big character, Captain Phasma. I hear a lot about how intimidating Captain Phasma is and how she's such a cool villain for Finn, and the story was building up for Finn's fight with her, and The Last Jedi ruined it by killing her off. And if you hold that opinion, I, I beg you, 
please rewatch these two movies and actually think about what Captain Phasma does in the story. In The Force Awakens, she tells him to keep his helmet on and reprimands him for having a panic attack, and then at the end of the movie she gets beaten up by Chewbacca and thrown in the trash compactor. And that is all she does in that whole movie. And then in this movie she has this one fight scene with Finn that's pretty boring to watch in comparison to the throne room fight scene with Rey and Kylo, and she falls into the abyss. Honestly, I'm glad she's gone because she was never really here to begin with. Her character didn't matter to the story. And barely mattered to Finn. I don't know where this idea came from that she was this really awesome, badass, cool villain. She's boring, and I'm sorry, but that's just true. Once we get down to the Rebel planet, which is one of the coolest planets in the series, don't at me, we get a really nice moment between Poe, Rose, and Finn. Finn? Finn! Rose, you're not dead! Where's my droid? I just think that's really funny. But the comedy doesn't deflate the situation because it's immediately followed by Rose saying, This is all that's left. Like, it reminds the audience that at this point the rebels are like 30 people at best. This is probably the moment in the whole series when the rebels are at their worst. They're down to just about nobody and they're cornered on a remote planet and on top of that, the galaxy isn't seeming to answer their distress call. To them, they really are out of hope. So Poe makes a decision to launch a counterattack to buy themselves more time. I mean, once again, cinematography. Look at this stuff and tell me it isn't cool looking. Come on. As the fighters are slowly picked off, Poe realizes they're suffering too many casualties and he orders them to fall back. A parallel to the beginning of the movie. And Finn, however, wants to be a hero. He decides to sacrifice himself to destroy the cannon, taking down one final bit of the Empire with him. And despite what you might think, no, this isn't a noble sacrifice. Dying is easy, living is the challenge. Finn is valuable to the Resistance, as is every member. And what Poe learned with Holdo is that they can't afford noble sacrifices. Taking out bits of the Empire won't matter if the Rebels all die doing it. So Rose intervenes to save Finn telling him that we'll win the war not by killing what we hate, but by saving what we love. And that is the message behind Poe's arc in this movie. In order to learn to be a good leader, he needed to realize that he owes it to the rebels to keep them safe. When faced with the choice of hurting the Empire or protecting the rebels, Poe learns to always protect. Just when everyone has given up hope, thinking the spark is dead, Luke arrives. He didn't stay on the island to die, he came to fight for the galaxy, and to prove that he's changed, when he talks to Leia and says that he's here to face Kylo Ren, she tells him that Ben Solo is gone, and that Kylo Ren can't be saved. And Luke says, No one's ever really gone. No one is ever really gone. Vader was never really gone, and neither was Kylo Ren. Luke finally gets the chance to fix his mistake and confront Kylo, not by killing him, but to help him. Luke knows he's already failed too much to save the galaxy alone, but despite that, he still shows up. He still helps bring Kylo back to the light, and he still chooses not to kill anyone. It's fitting that the moment that Luke shows up, not one more person dies in this movie. Because as we know from the Luke we remember, he won't kill, because that would mean losing. Even though we all thought our Luke was gone, we were wrong. He was still in there. He just needed help, as Anakin needed help, and as Ben needs help. Despite what we saw before this, this is our Luke Skywalker. And here's where he gets the chance to finally prove it. While Luke is facing Kylo, Finn says they should go help him. And here's where we get to see Poe put his learning to the test. Instead of taking a chance to fight, he says, No, 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 we are the spark that'll light the fire that'll burn the First Order down. Quoting Admiral Holdo to show that he really does understand her sacrifice and that he is ready to lead. He uses this as a chance to escape, and there's a fun little Shekhov's gun in here too. They use the crystal critters to determine the fact that there has to be a natural opening if all of them manage to escape. So the rebels make a break for it, with Leia even officially turning command over to Poe, saying, What are you looking at me for? Follow him. Unfortunately for them, 
The escape route is blocked by Rebel, with Rey on the other side. This moment is Rey's final test. She can't use her lightsaber, she can't use her blaster or her techno knowledge. She needs to focus and use the force. We've seen in this movie so far that Rey's nearly unable to lift things with the force. It's her weakest skill by far. And so it's fitting that her final challenge is just using the force. It's lifting rocks as she put it earlier. And of course, she succeeds. It'd be really embarrassing if she fumbled at this moment. Luke and Kylo's duel plays out and surprise, Luke was just astral projecting the whole time. You could actually figure this out much earlier in the movie if you paid attention to a few things, such as you couldn't find his X-Wing outside, he was wielding the lightsaber that just broke, he doesn't kick up any of the salt when he moves, but Kylo does, and he entered through a blocked hole in the mine. Kylo Ren's rage got the better of him, causing him to get distracted on Luke and allow the rebels to escape. Luke gets the peace he's been seeking for so long, and he joins his masters as a force ghost. After Luke becomes one with the Force, the Rebels make an escape, and Rey and Kylo connect through the Force for a final time, leaving Kylo Ren alone to fester in his rage. With Snoke and Luke gone, the final episode is ready for Kylo Ren to be the ultimate evil, and for Rey to be the ultimate good to rise against him. Before we go, we get a small scene on the planet that Finn and Rose visited seeing a group of children tell stories about the Rebels standing up to the First Order. The camera follows one of the kids as they're told to get back to work. As he's sweeping, he looks up into the stars, no doubt thinking about the Rebels and the heroes in them. He clutches a Rebel insignia, dreaming of one day being greater. And as we know, he can be, because greatness can come from anywhere. That's The Last Jedi. I hope after listening to me talk about this movie for over an hour, you can see what I see in this movie. That it's beautiful. Where The Force Awakens fails, The Last Jedi shines. This movie gives each of its main characters complete arcs to fulfill, and has amazing themes that each story beat falls perfectly into. On top of that, the dialogue is clear and in character. The sound design and cinematography are amazing, and the plot makes sense. There's no convoluted garbage hoops the characters are constantly jumping through just to get the story going. And the only real problem I have with this movie is Finn and Rose's subplot. And I don't blame any of the actors for that. I love John Boyega. And Rose's actress is great too. I just think their plot was a bit wasted. But even then, Finn gets something in this movie. In The Force Awakens, he doesn't change or grow. He gets the shit beat out of him in literally every fight, and that's it. Here he learns his place in the rebellion, and he actually has things to do. All of this is also ignoring the on-point acting. Every single actor in this movie just kills it. No one misses. Whereas The Force Awakens has dozens of weird lines and deliveries, every moment in this movie just works for me. With the exception of Finn and Rose's story. I fucking talk about that all the time. You get it. I don't like that part of the movie. You get it. I really just protect my ass here when people... It's not a good part of the movie, okay? And one of the best parts for me about this movie is how well it sets up a third movie. Kylo and Rey finally get to be themselves. Kylo Ren gets to be one of the strongest Sith ever to live, with Rey rising in the light to match him. Poe learned how to be a leader and can carry the resistance to winning the war. And Finn's learned to stop running, and that he has a place in the rebellion, just as everyone else. The third movie was set up so perfectly to be an absolute banger. Now let's talk about that movie. It's bad. The Rise of Skywalker is really, really bad. Now, I'm gonna run down all the reasons why. Somehow Palpatine returns, Kylo Ren rebuilds his helmet, Luke rebuilds his lightsaber, Leia is leader of the Resistance again, Palpatine's plan makes no sense, assassins have dumb map daggers, the Death Star isn't actually destroyed because a big piece of it is just right there, characters stumble into solutions and problems all the time, force healing's a thing now, Rey is still being pulled by the dark side, Finn needs to tell Rey something, Lando is back for no reason, Hux dies in a dumb way, quicksand doesn't work like that, Kylo Ren throws himself at Rey for some reason and lives after a horrible crash, Bar Lady is back, to give Chewie a pointless medal, Rey's parents aren't nobody since her dad is actually Palpatine's kid, Poe and Finn aren't characters, there's a homophobic slug, horses in space, Knights of Ren are wasted, Rey is a better pilot than Poe for some reason, Gabu Frick doesn't get enough screen time, every ship has Death Star lasers now, Chewbacca dies but not really, C-3PO dies but not really, Kylo Ren dies but not really, Rey dies but not really, and Palpatine's death means nothing because he already died before, why won't he just come back now? And to top it all off, Rey buries Luke and Leia's lightsabers on Tatooine 
between, a planet Luke hates, Leia's never been on, and Anakin hated, and for some reason, Rey takes the last name Skywalker despite just making out with Ben Solo, a descendant of the Skywalkers. What, what are we doing here, guys? So that's the rise of Skywalker, and that's the end of the video. When I started this project, I wanted to see if the sequel movies were as bad as I remember them being. And I come to the conclusion that one of these movies was never bad to begin with. And in fact, it was amazing to me. And I hope after listening to me talk about it for over an hour, you understand why I think that too. And hey, even if you disagree with me on anything I've said, that's cool too. I'm just happy you checked out the video. All right, that's it. I'd like to thank you so much for watching this video. And if you'd like to see more videos like this one or more of just my handsome face in general, please send me all the support you can. I get off on praise.